so much. It's such an honor to be here. Such a pleasure. Um, oh, the gift of poetry. <laughs> oh my God, wait, so there's people who've never been to a poetry reading in this room, is that right? Like, wait, how many? Will you raise your hands again? I just want to know. Oh my God! <gasps> I've always wanted to be a gateway drug. <laughs> oh, okay. That's really exciting for me. Hopefully, it will also be exciting for you. <laughs> um, I'm going to read 10 poems, and I'm giving you that number because poetry readings are uncontrollable. <laughs> but that will hopefully give you some semblance of control. <laughs> and that way, if you don't like what you're hearing, you can just sort of count down in your head. <laughs> and if you do like what you're hearing, you can be like, oh my god, five more, right? So I'm just going to say 10. I feel like that's a good number. It's solid. Should get us out in plenty of time to go have beverages. Um, this is a poem that is about the day before the Kentucky Derby. It's called the Oaks Day, and it's when all the Phillies race. And it's my favorite race um, because it's the ladies. How to triumph like a girl. I like the lady horses best. How they make it all look easy. Like running 40 miles per hour is as fun as taking a nap or grass. I like their lady horse swagger after winning. Ears up, girls, ears up. But mainly, let's be honest, I like that they're ladies. As if this big, dangerous animal is also a part of me. That somewhere inside the delicate skin of my body, there pumps an eight pound female horse heart. <laughs> Giant with power, heavy with blood. Don't you want to believe it? Don't you want to lift my shirt and see the huge, beating, genius machine that thinks, no, it knows. It's going to come in first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a poem that I haven't read in a while, but it's kind of a fun poem to read. So you'll just have to forgive me. Um, I'm, I'm indulging my, myself in a guilty pleasure. Uh, all I can really say is it's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me just say that, OK, there was a moment when I was a much younger poet um, that I fell in love with an older poet, and then I moved in with him. And um, I don't want to say mistake. <laughs> but I don't believe in regrets. But this poem is at the moment when I realized that I should have made some other decisions. <laughs> Service. Somewhere outside of Albuquerque, I was all fed up with the stories about your ex-girlfriend's guest billboard in New York City. And to make matters worse, I had to pee like a racehorse. Or like a girl who had too much to drink way too far from home. You stopped at a friend's body shop to talk about a buddy who was stuck someplace in Mexico. You were talking, pulling strings, and taking pulls off a brown bottle. And no one told me where the restroom was. So I walked back where the, all the hot rods were displayed like dogs ready for a fight, bearing their grills like teeth. I was hungry. The air smelled like hot gasoline and the sweet carnation smell of oil and coolant. A girl pit bull came and circled me as I circled the cars. She sniffed my ankles like I was her kin or on some kind of rescue mission. You were still talking, not a glance in the direction of me and the bitch working our ways around the souped up Corvettes and the power tools. The pit was glossy, well cared for, a queen of the car shop. 
And when she widened her hind legs and squatted to pee all over one of the car's dropped canvases, I took it as a challenge. <laughs> that strong yellow stream seemed to be saying, girl, no one's gonna tell me when to take a leak, <laughs> when to bow down, when not to bite. So right then, in the dim lights of the strange garage, I lifted my skirt and pissed like the hard bitch I was. <laughs> He's doing just fine, so. Um, eight more to go. Uh, Bruce read this poem about trees, and I was thinking about the sugar maple and trees in general. And then Adrian Rich poem wonderful poem at the end about, right, we have to listen and talk to trees. And so I felt like um, a poem that begins, or at least is the third book in, uh, or third poem in the uh, fifth book, um, when I was really trying to figure out where I came from, I kind of ended up on trees. Ancestors. I've come here from the rocks, the bone-like chert Obsidian, lava rock, I've come here from the trees. Chestnut, bay laurel, toyon, acacia, redwood, cedar, 1,000 oaks that bend with moss and old man's beard. I was born on a green couch on Carragher Road between the vineyards and the horse pasture. I don't remember what I first saw the brick of light that unhinged me from the beginning. I don't remember my brother's face, my mother, my father. Later, I remember leaves through car windows, through bedroom windows, through the classroom window, the way they shaded and patterned the ground, all that power from roots. Imagine you must survive without running. I've come from the lacing patterns of leaves. I do not know where else I belong. <coughs> That's a poem for trees. Um, Speaking of ancestors, this is a poem I wrote for my mother. Um, I have scoliosis, which many people do. It's just a curvature of the spine. Mine happens to be somewhat significant. Um, and so when I was uh, a kid, most of my life, my mom drove me to physical therapy to try to make sure I uh, could walk. Um, this is a poem about that moment. The raincoat. When the doctor suggested surgery and a brace for all my youngest years, my parents scrambled to take me to massage therapy, deep tissue work, osteopathy, and soon my crooked spine unspooled a bit. I could breathe again and move more in a body unclouded by pain. My mom would tell me to sing songs to her the whole 45 minute drive to Middle Two Rock Road and 45 minutes back from physical therapy. She'd say that even my voice sounded unfettered by my spine afterward, so I sang and sang because I thought she liked it. I never asked her what she gave up to drive me or how her day was before this chore. Today, at her age, I was driving myself home from yet another spine appointment, singing along to some maudlin but solid song on the radio. And I saw a mom take her raincoat off and give it to her young daughter when a storm took over the afternoon. My God, I thought. My whole life, I've been under her raincoat, thinking it's somehow a marvel that I never got wet. Good to write thank you poems for the people that are in your lives. Here's a thank you poem for a weed. <laughs> what's a weed? Who gets to decide what's a weed or a flower? 
Um, I should say that the speaker of the, of the book is going through fertility treatments and trying to have a child. Um, and the speaker is also me. <laughs> it just seems so silly to keep saying speaker. <laughs> I am the person in these poems. <laughs> this is a poem <laughs> about dandelions. But I think it's important to know that I was also going through fertility treatments at this time, and so this fact of how they reproduced was also very charged for me. Dandelion insomnia. The big ass bees are back, tipsy, sun drunk, and heavy with thick knitted leg warmers of pollen. I was up all night again, so today's yellow hour seems strange and hallucinogenic. The neighborhood is lousy with mowers, crazy dogs, and people mending what winter ruined. What I can't get over is something simple, easy. How could a dandelion seed head seemingly grow overnight? A neighbor mows the lawn and bam. The next morning, there's a hundred dandelion seed heads, straight as arrows and proud as cats, high above any green blade of manicured grass. It must bug some folks. A flower so tricky, it can reproduce asexually, making perfect identical selves. Bam, another me. Bam, another me. I can't help it. I root for that persecuted rosette, so hyper in its own making, it seems to devour the land. Even its name, translated from the French Dent de Lyon, means lion's tooth. It's vicious, made for a time that requires tenacity, a way of remaking the toughest self while everyone else is asleep. Um. Just five more to go, in case you were counting. <laughs> um, where do I want to go here? Uh, at one point, I was um, thinking about, you know, after you, after you have a, a couple books out, there's a moment where you, you realize that you're, you're writing some of the same stuff, right? You're going through some of the same stuff. And I have a poem in Bright Dead Things that's about why I don't have a tattoo. And it sort of cleverly says that my tattoos are my poems, right? Like there's this sort of, and I don't dislike the poem. But when I was writing this book, one of the questions that I posed to myself was what would it be to make sure that my truths were real and avoid any kind of cleverness. And so in this book, one of the things I tried to do was sort of re-examine some of those things. So this is the real reason I don't have any tattoos. I also had to ask my mother um, if, I could, if I could share this story. It's called The Real Reason. The real reason I don't have any tattoos is not my story to tell. It's my mother's. Once, walking down Bedford Avenue in my 20s, I called her as I did as I do. I told her how I wanted a tattoo on the back of my neck, something minor but permanent. And she is an artist. I wanted her to create the design, a symbol, a fish I dream of every night, an underwater talisman, a mother's gift on my body. To be clear, I thought she'd be honored. But do we ever really know each other fully? A silence like a hospital room. She was in tears. I swore then that I wouldn't get one. Wouldn't let a needle touch my skin, my arm, my torso. I'd stay me, my skin, the skin she welcomed me into the world with. It wasn't until later that I knew it wasn't so much about the tattoo, but the marking, the idea of scars. What you don't know, and this is why this is not my story, 
is that my mother is scarred from burns over a great deal of her body, most from an explosion that took her first child she was carrying in her belly, others from skin grafts where they took the skin to cover what needed it. She was in her late 20s when it happened, outside her studio in the center of town. You have to understand, my mother is beautiful, tall and elegant, thin and strong. I have not known her any other way. Her skin that I mapped with my young fingers, its strange hardness in places, it patterns like quilts here, riverbeds there. She's wondrous, preternatural, survived fire, the ending of an unborn child, heat and flame and death, all made her into something seemingly magical, a phoenix S. What I know now is she wanted something else for me, for me to wake each morning and recognize my own flesh, for this one thing she made, me, to remain how she intended, for one of us to make it out <coughs> unscathed. I once tried to read that poem while she was in the room and I thought that would be a good idea. <laughs> and then she was crying and then I started crying. And I thought, oh, I don't know if there's any recovery from this. I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just cry. <laughs> Um, uh, just four more poems, I think. That's right, yeah. Um, this is sort of a complicated poem about how I feel about the national anthem. <coughs> a new national anthem. The truth is, I've never cared for the national anthem. If you think about it, it's not a good song. It's too high for most of us. It's, <laughs> it was the rocket's red glare, and then there are the bombs. Always, always, there is war and bombs. Once I sang it at homecoming and threw even the tenacious high school band off key. But the song didn't mean anything. Just a call to the field, something to get through before the pummeling of youth. And what of the stanzas we never sing? The third that mentions no refuge could save the hireling or the slave. Perhaps the truth is every song of this country has an unsung third stanza. Something brutal snaking underneath us as we blindly sing the high notes with the beer sloshing in the stands, hoping our team wins. Don't get me wrong, I do like the flag. How it undulates in the wind, like water, elemental, and best when it's humbled, brought to its knees, clung to by someone who has lost everything, when it's not a weapon, when it flickers, when it folds up so perfectly you can keep it until it's needed, until you can love it again, until the song in your mouth feels like sustenance, a song where the notes are sung by even the ageless woods, the short grass plains, the Red River Gorge, the fists full of land left unpoisoned, the song that's our birthright, that's sung in silence when it's too hard to go on, that sounds like someone's rough fingers weaving into another's, that sounds like a match being lit into an endless cave, the song that says, my bones are your bones, and your bones are my bones, and isn't that enough? Um, I want to, I'm going to have three poems that are a little shorter, um, and, uh, this is a spring poem, but I, it's just, it's a poem of hope, and so I want to read a poem. I'm not a winter person. I try to be. <laughs> uh, I'm a spring person. I like it when everything comes back. Instructions on not giving up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crab apple tree, more than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains. It's the greening of the trees that really gets to me. 
when all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets, leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath. The leaves come, patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us, a return to the strange idea of continuous living, despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine then, I'll take it, the tree seems to say, a new slick leaf unfurling like a fist. I'll take it all. Um, I uh, just want to read two love poems. Uh, the first love poem is a, a sort of quick prose poem. Uh, when I was about to get married, um, my father-in-law, who has Alzheimer's, was living with us. And also my uh, husband's, or husband-to-be, uh, his ex-girlfriend died and uh, suddenly and left two cats, two older cats, and no one would take them in New York. And in New York, a lot of people have like non-pet-friendly buildings, so no one could take them. Um, so we ended up taking these cats. Uh, <laughs> So this is sort of a story about all these things happening at once. It's a prose poem, so it reads kind of fast. The Last Drop. You've just left your dad in Virginia with your brother after taking him to the neurologist to confirm that it is, in fact, Alzheimer's. Now you're driving to New York to get your dead ex-girlfriend's cats who need a home, and even though we weren't planning on cats, they're 15, and who's gonna take them? And you know them already, and why not give some animals a home, even if it is another 20 hours of driving there and back? I tell Manuel about your travels, and he says, it's a good premise for a horrible road trip dark comedy movie. <laughs> and there is something funny about it all. Your father hates cats, but they love him. And I spent a long time envious of your ex-girlfriend's beauty, and now I only miss her and want to love her cats for her. My memoir could be titled, Everything Was Fine Until It Wasn't. My memoir could be called, I Thought I Wanted a Baby, But All I Got Was Your Dead Ex-Girlfriend's Two Old Cat. <laughs> <laughs> My memoir could be called, Before the Wedding, You Must Suffer a Little. <laughs> My mother's motto is, nothing is easy, and I tease her for it, but it's true. Before he left, your dad said he didn't understand the saying, good to the last drop. Does that mean the last drop is bad, he asked? <laughs> no, I reassured, it means all of it is good. Every single drop of it is good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna close with a poem for writers, but also a poem for the partners of writers. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but I got these texts from my husband. He sees me on the road, and he sees me on Facebook and Twitter, etc. And he says, oh, you look great out there, and blah, blah, blah. And um, as he was saying that, I realized like I was, like, had been sort of wearing the same thing for, for four days, <laughs> writing something and in my head. So uh, this is a poem for him. Love poem with apologies for my appearance. <laughs> Sometimes I think you get the worst of me. The much loved loose forest green sweatpants, the long braless days, hair knotted and uncivilized, a shadowed brow with the devilish thoughts through the hoofed dance on the brain. I'd like to say this means I love you. The stained white cotton t-shirt, the tears, <coughs> pistachio shells, the mess of orange peels on my desk. But it's different than that. I move in this house with you the way I move in my mind, unencumbered by beauty's cage. I do like I do in the tall grass, more animal me than much else. I'm wrong. It is that I love you, but it's more that when you say it back, lights out, a cold wind through curtains, for maybe the first time in my life, I believe it. Thank you.